you're not feeling small today you should be feeling large because today is a large day i don't know why it just feels like that maybe because the sun is shining the sky is blue and i am a happy camper hi i'm ray renati i'm your host of green room on air uh, if you don't know what green room on air is if this is your first time listening or you forgot we talk about all things entertainment with an emphasis on bay area theater however it's not only that I've chatted with people from New York City, France, Los Angeles, cast members of Stranger Things, all kinds of cool stuff. And today, we have two special guests. Two special guests from theater, the theater of Yugen in San Francisco, California. Shannon Davis and Nick Ishimaru. Nick is the artistic director and Shannon is the artistic associate. Opening this weekend, a brand new play called Puppets and Poe, based on the poems of Edgar Allan Poe. The uh, play is going to incorporate those poems, puppetry, and actual human beings. This is a new work, a collaborative work, designed, written, and performed at Theater of Yugen. Theater of Yugen is very special. All of their plays are based on Japanese traditional theater uh, with a mix of Western traditions. It's very, very exciting, very eclectic, and I cannot wait to see this show. So, without further ado, I bring you Shannon Davis and Nick Ishimaru. Well, here we are in the office with Nick and Shannon. Mm -hmm. It definitely looks like a, an office of a theater company. <laughs> that it does. Yes. Ca creative yep. chaos is what we like to call it. <laughs> Maybe you can paint a picture for us. What do I see here? I see... Uh, lots of bamboo on the walls. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have one of our, our traditional phrases from our Kilgen shows uh, taped up in uh, newspaper letters. It says, I am a man from this area. Mm -hmm. And that's what that means. I am a man from this area. I am. I am a person from this area. Most uh, traditional Japanese kyogen plays begin that way. Yep, it's the opening line of most of those. Uh, see, we have certificates of appreciation from uh, Japanese Cultural Festival Committee uh, from October of 2018. Uh, we have the signed that the uh, the proclamation of Theater of Yugen Day, which is May 25th by the mayor of San Francisco. Uh, we have our San Francisco City and County of San Francisco, San Francisco minimum wage ordinance posted. Minimum wage in the city is fifteen fifty nine an hour, ladies and gentlemen. Um, business certificates. What else do we see, Shannon? Well, we also have the tome, the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe sitting right next to me. Edgar Allan Poe. So let's talk about that. That's is, this is uh, your new play. What's the name of it exactly? Um, so Puppets and Poe. Puppets and Poe. Yep. A great alliteration there. Thank Puppets you. Puppets and Poe. And, and did you guys write this? Uh, Edgar Allan Poe is our inspiration uh, for our whole play. And uh, that means we use some of his words and some of our own and some of them combined. And then sometimes we use no words at all. Ah, no words at all. Puppets who don't talk. Yeah, some of the puppets don't talk. We do some mime, we do some clown, we do some dancing, and mm -hmm. maybe even some singing. Yeah. So, so what's the process here of developing the play? Is it is it already written? Is there a script? Or uh, are you kind of doing it as you work? We're uh, building the plane as we're flying it, okay. uh, as most devised works go. Yeah. Uh, so uh, right now I would say about half of the script is written. Uh, and we're in our second week of rehearsal, so I'd say that's pretty darn good. Um, a lot of the words that are written are pose. Uh, a lot of them will be rewritten, reworked, um, like a lot of other things in our show. Uh, pose words are going to be recycled and reused. Um, so we're devising daily. Like today, we will write something and we will build something. And we will read something from Poe. That's pretty much our daily process, those three things. And what are your, some of your biggest challenges in doing this with with, a, a, with Poe or with him because it's written as as poems to be read? Uh, how do you do this? How do, how do you make it work? Um, so I noticed uh, that's kind of a, a 
twofold question because, um, in the process, one of the challenging things is remembering to stay collaborative and say yes. And, um, as human beings, we want to edit first, um, but we need to create before we can edit. Um, and especially in a devised work, uh, we save editing until the, well, not the last minute, but probably the third week of our five weeks. Um, and so just remembering to stay open to all the possibilities and ideas that can come from collaboration. Um, so that's like a, a personal challenge that I have. And then also like, uh, as the director a challenge that I notice, um, and then specifically with Poe, a lot of his language is, um, I wouldn't say archaic, but just um, not something that's readily available to our modern ear or sensibility. Um, even his short stories, they were written to be read in one sitting, but one sitting back in the mid 1800s was very different than a sitting now, right? We have six second vines that like entertain us right now. So one sitting of Poe feels like, you know, a six volume novel yeah. <laughs> to our modern sensibilities. For those who are listening and don't know what Vine is, it's an old, old, old company that went out of business about a year ago, right, Nick? <laughs> oh, did Vine go out of business? I didn't realize, actually. <laughs> Just how much attention I paid. Um, yeah, it used to be six second videos yeah. and then it disappeared because I guess those were too long, maybe. Wow, yeah, maybe. I don't know. That wouldn't um, surprise me. Yeah. Nick, what did, what have you found um, maybe personally challenging or challenging as a oh, artistic um, director? I agree with you actually about the editing process. My instinct, uh, since I've spent a lot of time directing and and running things lately, uh, my immediate instinct is to jump to the editing process mm -hmm. and just try and start limiting things as they're being put out on the table. Um, I also struggle with improv as a performer, mm -hmm. so yes, and is uh, to, to be able to do that genuinely is really hard for me. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I find that I, I struggle with personally is the actual building of pieces, the building of puppet pieces and sets and things like that. Um, my, my, I guess my visual area was more costuming when I was, when I was coming up in theater. And so, uh, to be able to put my mind towards puppet puppets and props and set building is very challenging for me. Mm. Um, I don't think of the world in architectural terms, I suppose. So that's like visualizing and executing has been a big issue. Yeah. Maybe we'll just lean on your talents heavily when it comes to costuming the puppets too. Yeah, that could work. <laughs> You've costumed a lot of puppets in your life. Oh no, 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 <laughs> oh, no, people. but I've designed, yeah, people. I have designed costumes for many people. Um, and I have some background in actually creation and, and uh, sewing and stitching and such. So yeah. I, I have worked in costume shops before. Um, that's definitely more my area than set. <laughs> so the yes and thing is a big thing uh, when you're creating a new work, because mm -hmm. if you start saying no, but that, right. it kind of shuts things down, right? You, it does. Yeah. It, it doesn't feel nice to hear that, you know, like it's maybe not the kindest thing, um, but also it really limits the potential of what the idea could be or uh, different ideas that could stem from it. So maybe somebody says something that we all think is ridiculous and silly and we might not use it. And it could uh, spur another idea that's genius and ties everything together. And, you know, like, how dare we try to edit that before we got to it? Um, yeah, there's circuitous ways that we could that we come to ideas. But that's part of the devising process. Mm -hmm. We have to say yes. And, and even it, if it feels silly, I would imagine it creates a, a, a more uh, creative atmosphere. So people aren't afraid to say things and come up with ideas. Um, I, although I guess it could slow things down a little bit. It, it absolutely slows things down, yeah. but that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Love it. Yep. I love it. I'm most, uh, and even as a director, I have to say sometimes, you know, you feel rushed mm -hmm. and you don't want to hear a lot of yes ands. Honestly, I'm just being honest with you because yeah. I got to get to the next scene or we have, uh, you know, tech in two weeks mm -hmm. or... Mm -hmm. But the thing is, um, the truth is that when you do say yes and you and you give it time, when you try out new ideas and you're willing to do that, mm -hmm. you actually create a better uh, piece of art, yeah. I think. Definitely. And it's, it's hard, though, to, as you said, to discipline yourself to do that because human be as human beings, we want to move on. We want to keep going forward. It, it and I, and I do it too yeah. as the director, even though, you know, I'm trying to implement this yes and model, like, uh, that's, uh, part of 
uh, what we also do in our rehearsal room is um, we decolonize the structure. So it's not necessarily like a dictator director telling everyone what to do, but rather a group process. So the performers um, and our artists are uh, in charge of keeping me in check too, yeah. if I offend and go against the agreements that we've all set up. Mm-hmm. You know, that all works fine as long as you have a group of people or everybody's sort of um, on the same page. Mm-hmm. So that's why yeah. I guess casting's important. And oh, yes. Like yes. That. Because if you get one person in who has a different agenda, um, then you might have some problems, right? Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and luckily, everyone is, is really on board. And we did have lots of discussions with them uh, before we cast about what this process would be and made sure they understood and they were open to mm-hmm. what the process would be. Yeah. So. yeah. And we looked specifically for artists that we had worked with previously to, uh, to know, like, these are the pe- people we feel will, work, will really thrive in this kind of setting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the only one of the artists that I haven't worked with so far, or that I hadn't worked with previously, is Jamin. Jamin, yeah. yeah. Uh, and he's he, been wonderful. He's incredible. Yeah. Um, he comes out of circus and clowning and mime, and he just has a real open, vivacious spirit. And so working with him has been very easy. But yeah. um, I've worked on, a pro- uh, Shannon and I have both worked on projects with the rest of the performers before. So. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I love mime. Mm-hmm. Why do people make fun of mime? Uh, because mime never turns off. Never turns off. What does that mean? That is a really good answer. Uh, because uh, once a mime, always a mime, all the time. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mimes are always doing miming things. Like always. When you're with them, they think of a mime. Um, which always. is a blessing and a curse. <laughs> but, but we're really harnessing his powers for good in this show. Mime yeah. never turns off. I love that. I got to remember that. <laughs> All you mimes out there, all two of you, we love you. Yep. Yeah. We do. Yeah. And um, now the puppets. Mm-hmm. Tell me about the puppets. Yeah. So uh, that was another um, ideation we had uh, a session about. Um, you know, we we chose Poe because, uh, well, there are many reasons we chose Poe, which we can get into. Um, but then also we wanted to do a puppet piece this season, uh, because of the talents of the people that we have and kind of our core Yugen group. Mm-hmm. Um, Steven Flores, who you met right out there is yeah. a, is a puppet artist. And, um, he also wanted to work on creating a whole puppet world. Um, and so puppets and Poe is not something you normally see together. And there was something kind of, um, surreal and disturbing about using such heavy, dark material with something so light and fun and kind of pairing those together. Um, so we thought we'd give it a try and it's actually been, um, creepily effective. Yeah. Quite. I've seen puppetry in France. That's sort of like that where they have, Mm -hmm. what's that called? There's a, there's a tradition in France. There's even a theater company in the city that does it. They don't do it with puppets though. Um, uh, it's like we're, it's like disturbing material, but done in a light it, way. Yeah, and um, it makes it more disturbing. I can't Fre- remember French the... people is what's that? That's <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, all, yeah. all the French. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My wife is French, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what that's called. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember the name of the yeah, company. The only, Good, the only Good, thing that comes Gr- to mind is Grand Guignol. That's it. Oh, oh, that's yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I've yeah. actually never heard of Grand Guignol to be, being done with puppets. That would be extremely disturbing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've seen it in, in France. I've seen oh, it in okay, France, and okay. it is very disturbing. And there were children there. <laughs> oh, yeah. But yes, they love yes. it in France. They love puppets. And you know, <laughs> I, I, we should we should say that maybe this isn't a show for children. Yes. Um, but yeah. it, that depends on what sort of a parent you are and what you believe is acceptable. So yes. there's definitely swearing, and there's definitely dark themes, and probably a naked puppet. Ooh, um, yes. Yes. But, but nothing... I, I mean, if I had kids, I'd bring them. What yeah. the heck? <laughs> yeah, well, they would, they'd, be, they'd be very advanced They'd be children. open, yes. yes. Very yes. open yes. children. <laughs> children of artists always are. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's mine, as mine are. Um, <laughs> so tell me about you, uh, not you, I mean, no, and what's the other? Kilgan. Tradi- Kilgan, yes. Tell me yeah. about that. Oh, this so is Japanese, is Japanese traditional theater? Yes. Uh, well, yes. Um... No and Kyogen together constitute the oldest living art form or, or oldest living theater form on earth today. Um, they've been practiced continuously since the late 1300s, early 1400s, uh, and have been passed down from teacher to student ever since then. Um, 
the no is actually i really don't even think of no as theater anymore uh i've been studying no a lot both here at theater view again and with uh theater nogaku who is based uh, as which is a sort of like our brother company um based both in japan and america and we study primarily with akita school of no uh, and over that time i've come to think of no more as performative ritual rather than theater the kinds of trappings we expect from theater uh like dialogue and uh, climactic plot the kinds of things that aristotle described as as uh, being heavily important to drama in his in his poetics um, are things that just don't really apply to no and the goal of no is not to put on the same kind of theatrical enter entertainment. Um, and I use entertainment as a very loose word. I don't mean that as like an uplifting comedic moment, but something that is very is supposed to be audience engaging. No does not really do that in a dramatic way. No, the power of no comes from the power of its ritual and the, 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 uh, the process of the creation of the event and the execution of the event is what the power of no is. Um, here at Theater of Yugen, we specialize actually in the brother form of no called Kyogen. Kyogen is a traditional comedic form. It's satirical or farcical, and it's based in the human living world, whereas No is based in the spirit world and in uh, the grand myths of people who have died or the memories of very famous events. Kyogen, like I said at the beginning here, is uh, usually starts with the line, I am a man from this area, or I am a resident of this area, as we translate it now. Um, and that indicates that I, like you, live here. I am one of the people. And the story I'm going to tell you today, or the event you're about to witness, is something that could have happened to anybody. Um, the characters in Kyogen have simple names like Taro, Jiro, and Master, which just means like the first man, the second man, and, ma and the master of the house. Um, and they are stories that are designed to help people uh, experience the, the humanity of their daily lives and of the things that we go through as people. And um, here at Theater of Yugen, we are one of the only companies in the world that does Kyogen in English, and we are the only company that does Kyogen in English regularly as part of a repertory performance. Right. And now the only one for sure that does it with puppets. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Kyogen is definitely not a puppet using form. Um, that would definitely be more Bunraku, which yeah. is a much later invention. And we are not using Bunraku in Puppets and Poe. Um, there's actually not even a lot of No or Kyogen in this. Um, we're mm. using bits and pieces of the aesthetics in different places. Obviously, I've been training now in No and Kyogen for uh, 11, almost 12 years. Um, so it's, it, it's impossible for me to not have some of that in anything mm. that I perform in inherently. Mm. But it's not something I'm seeking out unlike in other performances say like a no christmas carol which we do pretty much every december which is very identifiably no kyogen and kabuki like that is not the kind of thing you'll be getting with puppets and poe yeah i love your part of the community in san francisco which i think makes san francisco sort of unique mm -hmm. in the country where we have all of these small theaters that do really specific sort of um, genres of theater mm -hmm. that you wouldn't find in other places. Yeah. Um, and you have to look for them. I mean, yeah. it's too bad that it's too bad that the tourists who come to the city don't know about all these things, you know, yeah. and they go all the big musicals and stuff. Yeah. But um, and a lot of residents in the Bay Area don't even know about uh, theaters like like yours. But yeah. I think it's wonderful that they exist. I, I've noticed lately it's be they're becoming stronger again. And, I, and I've, mm -hmm. I've been here my whole life. And I noticed that whenever we have political strife, the smaller theaters start to thrive again. Have you noticed that at all? Um, for you? In, in some ways, yes. And in some ways, no. Yeah. Um, we're, Yugen is sort of caught in an unfortunate paradox between the skyrocketing cost of living yeah. and po politics. And it's because we're right at that uh, unfortunate intersection. It's been a challenge for us. Um, one of the things that small theaters can do, though, that larger theaters can't, is we have a lot more flexibility in terms of where we draw our funding from and how people choose to patronize us. Like... Um, like contrasting us with say uh, ACT, who has you know, a significant endowment and they have a, a, a very specific donor base. If they're not doing things that appeal to that donor base, then the donor base can pull their funding and it can dramatically impact the offerings that they can give. For us, because our donor base is very different and we rely much more on small number donors. Like if we 
uh, let's say that we change out our programming to try and attract a different donor base, it doesn't impact the way the, the, the ability for us to present work in the same way that it would ACT. We don't have to worry necessarily mm -hmm. about alienating specific big dollar donors by, by deciding to bring up political relevancy or to challenge certain political topics because we make that up with a, a whole different patron base that we can capture. In, in case in point, doing a piece like Puppets and Poe, um, you know, Poe was a straight white man. Um, puppets could be seen in whatever way. Uh, but we're doing this show. It's um, going to be politicized. Mm -hmm. It is because that's the climate that we're in. Mm -hmm. And we even politicize it by having um, voices and bodies of color, queer people and women on stage mm -hmm. um, speaking Poe's words. Mm -hmm. Uh, which isn't, you know, and I put in quotes, traditional. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So you have a lot more flexibility than the larger companies. Um, I, I feel that we do. And I think that the, the, ten, the, the trend that you notice about smaller theaters being able to thrive in these kinds of political climates, uh, I think that, that would be my supposition as to why. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. Well, I know you have rehearsal in five minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> Ish. Oh, yeah. Ish. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. Ish. Yeah. <laughs> we have we have plenty of time. They're what? they're gonna start building the puppets without us if we're yeah. in here. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. that's the wonderful thing about being able to work in this collaborative way is that even though Shannon is the director, mm -hmm. uh, she has been guiding our process. But this is very different from uh, I, you know, having three directors in the room. This is this is kind of unusual for us, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not that we are executing Shannon's directorial vision. Right. She has a vision for some pieces, like she has written some of the the scripts. Mm -hmm. um, she has very strong ideas about the the poem alone for example which mm. I know you've expressed is, is one of your favorite pieces um but it's not like if Shannon's not in the room work can't get done right or like if I'm not in the room work can't get done um they have plenty of things that they can do because they are devising their own ideas and they're free to create right and so it's nice because it means that we can actually step out of the room if we need to go do something or take care of a task or yeah. be with you for example <laughs> i love this how did you come up with this idea of, of this freedom of expression in producing a play i mean it's so unheard of because shannon uh, is a genius <laughs> no thank you i i draw my inspiration from my my nations my tribes um so i am ojibwe potawatomi and sami and uh it's just about um decolonizing the workspace so uh we've on the first day we formed agreements. There's, it's not rules that you know Nick is the producer and I is the director hand down. It's uh, agreements that we come up with together. It's ancient uh, Toltec wisdom, right? So, and it's also called the four agreements. Like we came up with these agreements that we uh, be true to your word, always do your best. Your best may vary from day to day. Uh, don't be late, you know, like, or be on time if you want to phrase it in a more positive way. Um, and everyone sat down and we just listed off our personal agreements and our promises to the group and we follow them. And then we also have an agreement to remind each other if we forget an agreement. Um, so it's, it's not, you know, um, pointing and accusing it's, Hey, remember you said you wanted to do that. Oh, thank you. Yep. I'm going to do that. Um, so it's just about keeping that positive energy, keeping our agreements to each other. Um, and then because they formed the agreements, they are responsible for their own work. Um, so if someone's uh, not pulling their weight, then they're just not going to get as much out of the experience. Mm -hmm. um, this, this piece is very much about process also, not just product. And we're, we've been very lucky with the people that we're working with. Everyone understands that and wants it to be successful. So they're just going to go and work. Yeah. Like we all want it to be awesome. Yeah. Yes. Love it. Tell me about your inspiration from your tribes. What is that? I yeah, don't quite so, understand what you were talking so about. So that's just how uh, things were run before colonization. <laughs> and, and, and what are these? Are these uh, Native American tribes or Japanese? or? Uh, what, yeah, oh. so I am not Japanese. Okay. Um, I've just also been trained in Kabuki and Kyogen, which uh -huh. is how I found myself here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am uh, Ojibwe and Potawatomi, and those are tribes or nations from the Midwest. And then I'm also Sami, which is the Norwegian reindeer herders, which is also a nomadic tribe. Um, and we uh, maintain uh, tribal affiliation and even reindeer hunting rights in Norway um, and Alaska. Uh, so that's my uh, background. And that's where I look to for inspiration when I'm building a, 
a, a piece um, because I think that that worked for so many years before colonization. Why can't it work again? And it's not just me. It's a very popular movement right now in theater um, and in the classroom to uh, decolonize it. And of course, it's not just from my nations or my tribes. That that wisdom is in many cultures. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the specific one that I look to. So we start each day uh, with a ritual of sorts. Um, we borrowed from my uh, tribe. So we smudge which is using sage, uh, smoke sage to, uh, it's considered a medicine in my way. Um, we use it, uh, to get on the same plane and to make sure that our intentions are good. So we smudge that way. We start that group and then we check in right away just to make sure that we're all honest about how we're feeling. And that's part of that agreement. Um, always uh, do your best. Your best may vary from day to day. So like today, I'm going to be honest, I'm a little tired and I need a coffee and I'm going to go like peace out and get one. And everyone knows that that's okay because we've checked in. Shannon's tired. Nick maybe is feeling a certain way. Ella's feeling great. You know, like we just want to check in and make sure we're taking care of each other as human beings. You guys are amazing. I've never heard of anything like this. Really? Well, I've been doing this, you know, my whole life. Oh. No, you know how it usually goes. You got <laughs> yes. five weeks and you got the schedule well, and, and you do this, 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 and, and then you open. And that's the way of it. That's the colonized way of it, right? Yes. I mean, like there's, there's other ways. That's colonists. <laughs> <laughs> I we mean, like, colonists. <laughs> well, we all have some colonists in us, right? You know, like it's unavoidable. Uh, yeah. Uh, like uh, when I approach this from a Japanese perspective, um, I, it's funny because I tried not to think of Japan as a colonized nation or as a colonized Mm. culture because so many of the practices that we talk about as being colonial practices are ones that are actually very traditionally Japanese, like the way that we run our lessons. Um, We do all at the beginning bow to each other and we say yoroshiku onagaishimasu, which means let's take care of one another. Mm. So there is an implicit understanding of consideration, but beyond that, it's very much you listen to your teacher, the teacher tells you what to do, and then you repeat what the teacher told you to do. This is not a collaborative effort. This is not a moment where the student gets to have voice or agency see strongly in the lesson or in what's happening. And when you are developing uh, performance pieces, it's the master performer says, this is what I want. And everyone else says, all right, this is what we're going to do. The master performer typically has a lot of freedom in how they get to make their choices, but everyone under them does not. And in, as it is Japanese culture, there is a strict hierarchy. Um, that was something that started to develop really more in the 1600s in the Neo-Confucian period. Um, but it's something that is distinctly Japanese. Uh, it is a cultural hallmark. And so working in, um, in this more native way of trying to really break out of that mindset, out of the hierarchical mindset and into a more communal or social environment, or, uh, socially minded environment, uh, is actually very challenging for me because like all of my training has either been traditional Western, like, um, musical theater. I grew up doing musicals. I love musicals. <laughs> me too. Yeah. 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 Musicals <laughs> uh, or traditional Japan, which is even more structured and higher hierarchical than American theater culture. Mm. So like this, this is a a huge departure for me, but it's really interesting to see where, or to see how this process works and where some of those allies are like Yoroshiko Onagashimas, which is a huge part of, uh, of the importance for us as performers in Japan. So it seems like you two have completely sort of, not completely, but sort of a uh, oppositional ways of looking at things yeah. normally. Yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah we do. We do actually. Yep. And um, you're, you get along, sort of. And, well, not uh, always. Not always. No. <laughs> <laughs> As all artists, but we definitely yeah. have conflicts. Yeah, but, but that's but, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Like, we, I think we both understand. I don't want to speak for you because <laughs> that's that would be against my way. Uh, but I mean, I definitely understand that working with people that aren't like-minded is fruitful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then that's the whole goal of Theater of Yugen is to bring together people of disparate cultures and through, uh, our, our, through, through our bodies, through our physical performances, we create an, an, a new environment where people can understand one another and where we bring cultures together and find those commonalities. Mm-hmm. That's, that's been the mission of this statement or the mission of this uh, company since it was founded. And actually, fun fact, um, Theater of Yugen has been doing mm-hmm. Japanese native hybrid work for Many generations. years now. Yeah. Um, Even f- before we got here. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, our founder, Yuriko Doi, uh, who came here from Japan, she is very fascinated in the mythological and sort of... Uh, it, uh, fable Spirit, overla- spiritual. Yeah, spiritual overlap yeah. between Japanese culture and various native cultures, mm-hmm. uh, d- different native nations. Um, and so she had developed a number of different pieces using a professional no performer from Japan, uh, Nomura Masashi. And, um, 
various members of different tribes. She'd worked a lot with the Iroquois and the Mohawk. The Mohawk, yeah. Um, um, and to, to put together, to, to find the overlaps between some of Japan's creation myths and the Iroquois creation myths and the Mohawk creation myths uh, and bring that together on stage. Uh, there was Moon of the Scarlet Plums. She did Crazy Horse. And most recently, I think it was about four years ago, it was Mystical Abyss, mm. um, which was just this a beautiful, beautiful piece um, that had very little dialogue in it at all. It was about an hour and a half of almost all dance. Mm-hmm. Um but still embodying those myths and those stories through physical dance. It was, and and we actually, I will shout out to the performers. Uh, we have four native performers in puppets and Poe. I'm sorry. Uh, we have a lighting designer and three native performers. That's what I was going to ask you. So they're native Americans or Japanese. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Native American. We, uh, Ariella Cooley, Stephen Flores and myself. Mm -hmm. And Harrison Moy is our lighting designer. Correct. And and he's also a native American Mm -hmm. part. Yep. I love that. You know, um, I think that politically, and I can, it's always bothered me how we don't uh, talk about the Native American problem in in this country. Um, We talk about other uh, oppressed groups, Mm -hmm. but there, and as you know, there are huge, uh, we we have the Navajo Nation, we have all of these Indian Mm-hmm. "Quote unquote Indian reservations mm-hmm. where people are are not giving regular uh, decent living conditions, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I, I visited them myself, and I, I'm glad that Elizabeth Warren is talking about this. Yeah, it's the only politician um, I've heard talk about it in a long, long time. Bernie does a little bit, but yeah, definitely yeah. Elizabeth Warren is a is I think an advocate, but I do not speak for all Native people, so yeah. um, you know I can only speak for myself. Oh no no! I'm not asking you to. <laughs> I just I always use that as a disclaimer because it's it's our way to make sure that everyone else knows we don't speak for all, just for one. No, this is me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is me in my opinion, yeah. uh, and um, and I realize it, it's very specific and personal to yeah. you, but uh, I just like I just like the fact that uh, it's being included, and yeah, and, and it's a big part. And sounds like maybe the major part of what influences you. Yeah, I mean, it definitely, um, my people are important to me, all human people, but my people specifically. Um, Native Americans do have the highest rate of suicide, the highest rate of death by police officer, the highest heart attack rate, the highest missing and murdered women rate, um, the most poverty, the highest rate of diabetes. Like, you go down the list, we are right at the top. This is exactly what I was talking about, and that's that's why. I think it's great that you're that you make it a priority mm-hmm. and that it's part of who you are and part of this production mm-hmm. and part of this theater company too. Yeah. Yeah. And right. you can that feel was, it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I always believe there's an atmosphere to places, you mm-hmm. know, and I feel a lot of positivity in this building. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I hope that I know some people think that's crazy, but um, for me, it's, it's real. Oh, yeah. it's Not a, you're talking to two pagans. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> okay. uh, and, and I mean, because uh, like I keep saying, no has been at that intersection of ritual and theater for so long. Yeah. And we've practiced so much of that here at the space. Like this is a ritualized venue. The venue right. itself is home to uh, more than just theater. This is a, this is a ritual space. Um, yeah. and like, I know even personally, I still think of theater as ritual, um, going yes. back in a number of different directions culturally. Um, it might not always look like it in the final performance, but there is a ritual process to theater, regardless of how it's created or structured. It is right. an offering for something much greater than ourselves and just for a human audience. Yeah. You know, I have to say, I mean, I grew up Catholic and, uh, As many of our performers did also. Uh, yes. yes. And I think there are a lot of um, dedicated theater performers who were Catholic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I really believe that theater has replaced that sort of ritualistic, spiritual aspect yeah. for them. Because the Catholic Church is so rife with conflict and there's so many problems. We don't need to get into all those. But for right. me, it, it, that's what it's become. And I think it's... I, I've talked to a lot of people who were who are quote unquote ex Catholics yeah. and also mm-hmm. theater performers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, and there's amazing there's an amazing amount of and and I don't use this in a negative way that I've heard it before. There's an amazing amount of theater that happens in a Catholic church, yeah. and yes. it's and it can be quite beautiful. It can. Um, and so I just, I'm always looking for the, the beauty in, uh, ritualistic or religious aspects that I don't necessarily prescribe to myself, but there's a lot of 
beauty and the theatricality of religion. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And just to be fair to the Catholic Church, I mean, there are, for me, every church that I've been to, Catholic Church has its own personality and you know, outside of Rome, as you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just hard to find for me. It's been hard to find anything outside of Berkeley when I was there <laughs> that uh, spoke to me. And once I left there, I couldn't find any Catholic Church that didn't cause me problems. So, um, mm-hmm. but the theater has never failed me as far as that goes, mm-hmm. because it's, it's free. You, it, it, it celebrates human, the, the human spirit mm-hmm. in all of its forms. Well, and the, you know, bringing it back to Poe, he, you know, he's not the human spirit <laughs> cheerleader, but, uh, well, and, side, and, one side of it or a couple it, sides of it. it. No, and I will say that, um, where you can, where everyone can connect to Poe is his themes of, um, feeling alone, Mm -hmm. death and love. Mm -hmm. Those were the three main things that he talked about, which are something we all experience and which can all be beautiful and terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we're going to explore that spectrum between beautiful and terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, and hopefully there's some catharsis or some, um, religious experience to be had, uh, if you join us in the theater, um, that's our goal. Oh, and I will be, I am really looking forward to it. (laughs) I think I'm going Saturday after you open. Yes. Give us a, give us a day under our belt. Also, I just don't want to fight traffic getting up here on Thursday and (laughs) Friday. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Hear that. Absolutely. Parking is a lot easier on the weekend up here. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Oh yes. Yes. I know. Yeah. yeah, Because they have all those, uh, those businesses right up there. Right. And yeah. So plan extra time if you're coming on a weeknight. Yes. (laughs) Now, now the play opens when? We open Friday, October 4th. Mm-hmm. We have a, a public preview on Thursday, October 3rd. If you use the, the code PREVIEW at checkout, tickets are 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. Um, we run Thursday through Saturday at 8 p.m. Mm-hmm. until November 2nd. So that's four weeks? Mm-hmm. Five. Five, five, weeks. five weeks. Excellent. Yeah. And we, we might have an extension. We'll see mm-hmm. how tickets sell mm-hmm. out. Buy yeah. your tickets now, though, just in case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're selling pretty good already. Yeah, they are. It's going to sell out, folks. I yeah. think it might. Yeah. Puppets and Poe. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people can find you on the web. All they have to do is look up Theater of Yugen. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, Y-U-G-E-N. Theater. Yugen is Y-U-G-E-N. And theater is spelled in the European way, T-H-E-A-T-R-E. As all theaters <laughs> in San Francisco for some reason. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, we're global. We're global. We know yeah, what we're doing. That's right. We're part of the world. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I can't even spell out T H. E A T E R anymore. It feels, feels weird. Wrong. It feels yeah, wrong. It Unless I'm going to like century 16. Or something. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that reminds me. There's one other thing. Um, and this also is inspired me, uh, just as a human person, but also as a native woman. Um, our show consists of, we like to think about 99% post-consumer, um, recycled mm-hmm. material. Mm-hmm. So all of our puppets, our set, our words, our everything is recycled and reused. So we've been dumpster diving. You might see Starbucks cups on stage because we felt bad throwing them away or recycling them right away. So we washed them out and we might make a puppet out of them. Mm -hmm. That box that our microphone is sitting on, um, is going to be used as a set piece. Mm -hmm. Uh, just everything's recycled. Yep. So we're wow, um, taking care of our earth, being I'll be responsible. For this box, when it comes to the show, <laughs> you, yep, <laughs> you'll see it. Yep, it has some strawberries and other fruit. <laughs> yep. Okay, I got to remember that. I'll take a photo, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, but it'll all be, it'll all be sterilized and cleaned. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. oh yes, yeah, yeah. it'll be safe. <laughs> yeah. we don't want any no sick syringes actors. or no, anything. No, 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 none of that. No trash. <laughs> no, no actual trash. Yeah. yeah. Are you going to have any stunts? I know one of your actors, he's a stunt man, right? Yeah, he used to be. Um, and uh, a few of the rest of us are, we like to consider ourselves movers. Um, and <laughs> and I you're both def- in the show. Yes. Okay, yes, we yeah. are. Nick we're- and... And uh, Shannon. And yep, Shannon. We're, 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 I know your name. I know. Yeah. I just had a brain fart. We're all doing everything. <laughs> like we're all building, we're all performing, we're all devising, all hands on deck for everything that's mm-hmm. happening. Wow, this is exciting. This yeah. is really exciting. Yeah. 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 It should be an experience unlike anything people have seen here before. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, I'm going to put everything in the notes for the show and so people Great. can uh, link to it. Uh, the, your, your website, where to get tickets, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Great. Great. Thanks so much. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Yeah, you thank you for wonderful. having us. Thanks. Look forward to the show. Yay. All right. Well, there you have it. My conversation with Shannon and Nick from Theater of Yugen, two very talented theater professionals here in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
Uh, their show, Puppets and Poe at Theater of Ugin, is opening this weekend, October 3rd, uh, running through November 2nd. That's 2019, if you're listening to this far off in the future. <laughs> um, the show is, is uh, Thursday, Fridays, and Saturday nights at 8 p.m. at Theater of Ugin in the city. I will put all of the notes in the notes for this podcast on how to buy tickets and direct you to their website, or you can just search in the Google for Theater of Yugen. That's Y-U-G-E-N. Thanks so much, folks, for listening. And remember, if you liked this podcast, please go to iTunes and give me a, a fair rating, one through five stars, hopefully five, of course. And um, if you feel like it, uh, review the station. If you have friends who enjoy podcasts, uh, Tell them about this one, Green Room on Air, or uh, go to RaiseGreenRoom.com, RaiseGreenRoom.com. I'll say that again without mumbling, RaiseGreenRoom.com. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I am going to try to catch this show this weekend, Puppets and Poe, opening weekend. Can't wait. Looking forward to it. Okay. Until next time, you know what? I will see you on the boards. Goodbye, everybody. Say hello.